Tato. Welcome to this online service of St. Andrew's on the Terrace, Te Whanganui Atara, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you believe, whatever you do not believe, you are welcome here with us today. Inspired by stories of hope and injustice, we gather this day to embrace the task that is ours. May our hearts be strong for the work that we find. May our minds be open to the challenges it provides us. May our bodies be ready when the call comes, so that no one is ever left behind. On, the, on these promises we stand as those who see this world clearly and yet would see it no other way. Amen. And now for our first hymn, we're going to sing Shirley Murray's hymn, Where Mountains Rise to Open Skies. We'll just sing verses two and three that are shown on the screen. If you have your orders of service with you, that has the full hymn, so you can choose whichever verse you like to sing. Let's sing together. Your people's heart, your people's part, be in our caring for this land, for faith to flower, for aroha, to let each other's mana stand. something that might tell us clearly what it is that we're here to do, to offer. We have but stories of what has been, tales of what was hoped for and did not turn out, ideas of what might th make things better. May the story we hear this week inspire us in ways that bring us a hope-filled clarity about who we are, what we can do, what our lives might be about. As we walk this winding path, may we see the love and passion of those who journey with us and support and nurture each other in the work we set out to do. Amen. And now we're going to cross to Kezia and Jasper, Fiona and Alan. We're really lucky this week that we've got Kezia and Jasper, Jasper sorry, to light the rainbow candle for us and then Following that, Fiona will sing the Lord's Prayer in Te Reo Māori. And after that, Ellen and Fiona will read the contemporary readings for the day. So let's cross to them now. Kia ora. Each week at St Andrews, we light a rainbow candle as a symbol of our inclusive community and the special place of children and young people. And today, Kezia and Jasper are going to help with lighting the candle. Thank 
Kia tapu to ingoa, kia tai mai to rangatira tanga, kia mea te tau e pai ai ki runga ki te whenua, kia rite anō ki tō te rangi. Ho mai kia mātou ai anei, he tāro mā mātou mō tēnei rā. Murua mātou hārā, me mātou hoki e muru nei, i o te hunga. service when we pass the peace with one another. You may have people in your bubble that you wish to greet. Peace be with you. Or perhaps you would like to think of others in our community or maybe even give them a call after this service. Now we have a reading, Comparatively Speaking, There Is No Struggle by Jack Carter. When people like you tell me Things aren't as bad here as they are elsewhere. I wish you had been there, in the Waikato, or amongst my own people, the century before last, and every day after that, standing on land that is no longer yours, fishing from waters that no longer run pure, or at every hui, on every marae, that activates the words mana Māori motuhaki, which is every marae in the country. You seem to think things are better off here because you don't see us dying or visibly fighting, as if it, if it all happened in yesteryears. I tend to think that one of the worst effects of colonisation is when people no longer fight because they don't see a need and think that, comparatively speaking, everything's all right. So how many Māori have you convinced today that really us Māoris should consider ourselves lucky that things could have been worse, as they are with the Abos? Our Watch Now by Witi Ihimaira New Zealand had been Aotearoa. Just imagine, the treaty would have been honoured in 1840. Māori would have retained their tino rangatiratanga and Pākehā would have kawanatanga. Being kaitiaki, we, we would have heard huia still singing. We would have heard huia still singing today. Our seas would flourish with the thunder of sounding whales. Matariki would usher in Aotearoa New Year. This is not to say we wouldn't have had wars between us and through the years that there wouldn't have been pain and lots of anger and tears, but just imagine what might have been, what we could have seen and what it might mean. The representatives we send to the United Nations would be from Aotearoa, 
the Prime Minister would have a tāmoko and might even be a wahine ariki. Being kaitiaki, the huia would fill the air with coruscating beauty and incandescent trilling. Pods of tahora would thrill our blood with regular soundings along our shores. And tales all children would have learnt would be about whale riders, mountain movers, and mythical tanifa, Māori Earth, not Middle Earth. It's our watch now, the time to make dreams come true. Today is a good day to begin. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa pōnā mutumoana, kia tire te karohi rohi, Mua ito huarahi, aene a aki tonu atu. May the calm be widespread, no storms, but a glistening greenstone sea instead. And may the shimmer of rainbow lit spray ever dance over our pathway. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. Kia ora tato, and thanks again to Kezia and Jasper for lighting the candle for us and to Fiona and Alan for reading. A significant historical anniversary for Aotearoa passed this week and went seemingly unnoticed. 180 years ago, on 29th of April 1840, All Soul Wednesday, 32 rangatira from Te Atiawa, Ngati Tama and Ngati Toa boarded the small schooner Ariel in Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington Harbour. The rangatira had gathered to sign Te Tiriti Rokawa Moana, the Cook Strait sheet of the Treaty of Waitangi. Anglican missionary Henry Williams had translated the sheet from English into Te Rao Māori. Williams and Wellington merchant Thomas Clayton joined the rangatira on board the Ariel and witnessed their signatures. I'd like to acknowledge here that one of those rangatira was a woman, a wahini. Kahe Te Rao o Te Rangi signed the Cook Strait sheet on behalf of her Ngāti Toa and Te Atiawa people. Te Rao o Te Rangi was the grandmother of doctor, health officer, parliamentarian and minister, cabinet minister, Sir Maui Pomari. Perhaps that day in 1840 was like Wednesday the 29th of April this year, bright and sunny with a cool breeze ruffling the waves of the harbour. Maybe the aria rocked gently in the breeze, or for all we know a violent storm tossed the schooner about. This would have been more appropriate in terms of those, what those rangatira's signatures meant for the Māori people for the next 180 years. Williams had not made a literal translation of Titiriti. He mistranslated one word in the first article that is central to the understanding of the treaty. And this had enduring negative consequences for us all in Aotearoa, but particularly for Māori. William's translation created crucial differences in expectations about the exercise of power. Māori expected power to be shared between themselves and the British Crown. The Crown, with its notions of white supremacy, expected power would be transferred to Britain. Article 1 ceded sovereignty to the Queen of England, but the Māori translation hid this fact. Who says words have no power? Williams translated the word sovereignty as kawanatanga, a transliteration of governorship. This is at the heart of the inequities that we live with today. If we are to truly live our calling as followers of Jesus of Nazareth, the historic person who challenged the status quo, stood with the oppressed, the downtrodden and the marginalised, if we are to live our responsibilities as compassionate people who yearn for peace and equity, I believe that Pākehā or Tauiwi, all people in Aotearoa New Zealand who are not Māori, must reflect on the privilege that colonisation and the mistranslation of that one word has bestowed upon us 
at the expense of Māori. It's confronting, it's a challenge, and my experience working in this area is that it be can become a never-ending itch that's impossible to ignore. If the challenge is shared by a group, I believe the possibilities to make change are far greater than individuals attempting to do so on their own. That's why I'm reflecting on Te Tiriti today. I can no longer not see the disadvantage to Māori caused by my privilege. Back to the words and translation of Article 1. The late academic and writer Dr Ranganui Walker, who first and ferociously challenged my Pākehā worldview when he taught me at Auckland University in 1974, wrote that for Māori, kawana tanga was, quote, a benign term not evenly remotely, not even, sorry, remotely connected with the basic question of sovereignty. Those quotes. Dr Walker claimed that both translators, Henry Williams and James Busby, knew that the Māori equivalent to sovereignty was the word mana, which means evidence of rangatiratanga, chieftainship, or the right to exercise authority. Because they had used it to signify sovereignty in the 1835 Article of Confederation signed by the 35 Northern Rangatira, Dr. Walker wrote, if sovereignty had been translated as mana whenua, sovereignty over land, then the chiefs would have had no doubt as to its meaning. It is highly probable they would not have signed the treaty. The missionaries knew that loss of mana was anathema to the chiefs, but they had a conflict of interest because of their vested interest in land claims. At the same time, Hobson was impatient to be the undisputed governor of New Zealand, which required the chiefs to sign the treaty. This mistranslation enabled the Crown to begin its systematic, ongoing process of colonisation. When the Rangatira signed Titiriti in Wellington on 29th of April 1840, Māori owned most of Aotearoa. Within a century, the government and large private purchasers, like Edward Gibbon Wakefield's New Zealand Company, had whittled that away to a few pockets of land, leaving Māori throughout the country, often with too little land to subsist on. The government acquired the, government acquired the land by confiscation, alienation and through legislation that made it difficult for Māori to maintain their land under traditional ownership structures. We probably all know that, and we probably all know that Māori are overrepresented in poverty and incarceration rates, poor health and education outcomes, low and low life expectancy. The poor health rates mean Māori are at greater risk from COVID-19, which is why some iwi and their motu have set up roadblocks on their land. They are protecting their people. Natihine and Napui poet and writer Nadine Ann Hura recently wrote about how the COVID-19 lockdown in New Zealand is amplifying disadvantage and privilege in our country. She wrote, the trouble with the bubble is that it's invisible, the same way privilege is to those who have it. Some people will die of pneumonia this year, but more people will die and have died of systemic inequality is anyone keeping a tally of the numbers lost to racism? We who are Pākehā or Tauiwi might recognise the shameful statistics, but do we acknowledge that we have benefited from colonisation while Māori have suffered and continue to suffer? I work in the area of anti-racism, so I'm often involved in discussions about race and Aotearoa and, it, and the impacts of colonisation on all of us, Māori and Pākehā. People often say things like, well, we're much better than Australia, or Māori should be grateful they were colonised. Jack Carter's poem Alan read earlier expresses well the comparisons I often hear. She wrote, one of the worst effects of colonisation is when people no longer fight because they don't see a need and think that, comparatively speaking, everything's all right. 
New Zealand historian Dame Anne Salmond puts it better than I could. She wrote, it is possible that at present we are trapped in habits of mind that limit our potential as a small, intimate society, inhabiting some of the most beautiful and productive landscapes and seascapes in the world. Her reference to beautiful landscapes bring me, brings me back to Witi Ihamaida's poem. Can you imagine what our country might be like if Henry Williams had translated sovereignty accurately? If he and others hadn't used his mana to encourage the Rangatira to sign the treaty? If the British Crown hadn't believed the white race was superior and justified colonisation on the basis of that? If we had done the right thing under international law and honoured the Māori language version of the treaty? This brings me to one important final point, and that is that dismantling systems of oppression, including those based on race and class, is important for the powerful as well as the powerless. In the memorable words of American poet and scholar Fred Moten, I don't need your help. I need you to recognise that this is killing you too, however much more softly. It's never too late to begin action to create change. I've included in the newsletter a range of articles and books on the subject that some of you might find useful and interesting and perhaps we might together come up with ways St Andrews can become more active and work towards justice for all in Aotearoa and work to banish racism. Thank you for listening. Kia ora, kia kaha, aroha nui. Let's sing now, our life has its seasons. There's a time to be planting, a time to be plucking, a time to be laughing, a time to weep, and maybe a time to act. Let's sing together. Our life has its seasons. The gifts that we might bring as activists or writers or, or supporters. Um, and also at this time, we'll think about the donations, the financial donations that are made to St Andrews that enable it to thrive. Let's pray, thinking of all the offerings that we make here and now. We bring our gifts of awareness and willingness to join the struggle for justice in Aotearoa that all who live here may live well. We are thankful for the gifts of money which enable St Andrews to thrive. Amen. And now we are going to cross to Sue Hurst, who is going to read the prayers of the people that have been prepared by Pat Booth. Kia ora tato. This is the fifth Sunday we have not been able to meet together in our St Andrew's building. But we give thanks for the creative ways by which worship leaders have brought us together. We give thanks that decisions made by our government and public service have meant that New Zealand has not been impacted by COVID-19 as much as most other countries. 
We give thanks for all the essential workers who have made it possible for us to stay at level four in order to combat COVID-19, even at some cost to themselves. We, but we remember at this time of prayer the burdens many have been carrying, those who have lost jobs and the ability to care for their families, those worrying about family and friends in other parts of the world who may be in far more danger than we have been, families who have had bereavements which have nothing to do with COVID-19. We remember families who have not been able to honour their dead adequately because of constraints on gatherings. Today, as a community, we particularly remember 93-year-old Prue Wilson, who died last week after a stroke. Today, we also commemorate the 180th anniversary of the signing of Te Ritio Waitangi on a ship in the harbour of Whanganui Atara. So as we acknowledge the linking of two peoples, and as we acknowledge the links we have with each other in this community, we pray from the Anglican prayer book. Ka aru mātou i āte kraiti, tui, tui, tui a mātou, tui a ki te māmai, tui a ki te tūmanako, tui, tui, tui a ki te ora. We will follow Christ. Link, link, let us be linked together. Linked in pain, linked in hope, link, link, linked in abundant life. In our circle of prayer today, we think of the people of Algeria and the Protestant Church of Algeria. We remember the detainees of Manus and Nauru Islands, yearning that their cases be resolved. In New Zealand, we remember those in Parliament, and today we name Joe Luxton and Trevor Mallard, list MPs. Here in the Central Presbytery, we pray for the leaders and people of St Francis Cooperating Parish, Clive Homwana, and from the Worldwide Church for the African Protestant Church. And we finish our prayers with the prayer for St Andrews. If you are joining us from somewhere else, please feel free to make this a prayer for your faith community. Renew your people, God, and renew our life in this place. Give us a new spirit of unity with those of all faiths and a new spirit of love towards all people. Bless the city in which we live, that it may be a place where honest dealing, good government, the desire for beauty and the care for others flourish. Bless this church, that what we know of your will may become what we do, and what we believe the strong impulse of our worship and work. Amen. Thank you, Sue and Pat, for those prayers. Namihi nui. We're going to sing together now for our final hymn, Puria Ne E Te Hau. Um, the words are on the screen as usual. I'll read you a few words in the English translation. Scattered by the wind, cleansed by the rain, uplifted by the sun, all doubts are lifted away, all restraints cast off. Fly free, O Spirit. Uplifted by the sun, all doubts are lifted away. So now let's sing together this hymn by Hirini Melbourne.
us today. I hope you all have a good week. Stay well, stay safe, stay at home if you can, and be kind. And now for the final prayer of farewell and blessing. And for this, I've used some of the words from Witi Ihamara's poem, It's Our Watch Now, that we heard Alan read earlier. It's our watch now, the time to make dreams come true. Today is a good day to begin. May the calm be widespread, no storms, but a glistening greenstone sea instead. And may the shimmer of rainbow lit spray ever dance over our pathway. Amen.